Moby Dick by Herman Melville. Chapter 101 The Decanter. Ere the English ship fades from sight, be it set down here that she hailed from London and was named after the late Samuel Enderby, merchant of that city, the original of the famous whaling house of Enderby and Sons a house which, in my poor whaleman's opinion, comes not far behind the united royal houses of the Tudors and Bourbons in point of real historical interest. How long, prior to the year of our Lord 1775, this great whaling-house was in existence, my numerous fish documents do not make plain. But in that year, 1775, it fitted out the first English ships that ever regularly hunted the sperm whale, though for some score of years previous, ever since 1726, our valiant coffins and macies of Nantucket and the vineyard had in large fleets pursued that leviathan, but only in the North and South Atlantic, not elsewhere be it distinctly recorded here that the Nantucketers were the first among mankind to harpoon with civilized steel the great sperm-whale, and that for a half-century they were the only people of the whole globe who so harpooned him. In 1778 a fine ship, the Amelia, fitted out for the express purpose and at the sole charge of the vigorous Enderbys, boldly rounded Cape Horn, and was the first among the nations to lower a whale-boat of any sort in the great South Sea. The voyage was a skilful and lucky one, and returning to her berth with her hold full of the precious sperm, the Amelia's example was soon followed by other ships, English and American, and thus the vast sperm-whale grounds of the Pacific were thrown open. But not content with this good deed, the indefatigable house again bestirred itself, Samuel and all his sons, how many their mother only knows, and under their immediate auspices, and partly, I think, at their expense, the British government was induced to send the sloop-of-war Rattler on a whaling voyage of discovery into the South Seas. Commanded by a naval post-captain, the Rattler made a rattling voyage of it, and did some service, how much does not appear. But this is not all. In 1819 the same house fitted out a discovery whale-ship of their own, to go on a tasting cruise to the remote waters of Japan. That ship, well called the Siren, made a noble experimental cruise, and it was thus that the great Japanese whaling-ground first became generally known. The Siren, in this famous voyage, was commanded by a Captain Coffin, a Nantucketer. All honour to the Enderbys, therefore, whose house, I think, exists to the present day, though doubtless the original Samuel must long ago have slipped his cable for the great South Sea of the other world. The ship named after him was worthy of the honour, being a very fast sailor and a noble craft in every way. I boarded her once at midnight somewhere off the Patagonian coast, and drank good flip down in the forecastle. It was a fine gam we had, and they were all trumps, every soul on board, a short life to them and a jolly death. And that fine gam I had, long, very long after old Ahab touched her planks with his ivory heel, it minds me of the noble, solid Saxon hospitality of that ship, and may my parson forget me and the devil remember me if ever I lose sight of it. Flip? Did I say we had flip? Yes, and we flipped it at the rate of ten gallons the hour, and when the squall came, for it's squally off there by Patagonia, and all hands, visitors and all, were called to reef topsails, we were so top-heavy that we had to swing each other aloft in bowlands, and we ignorantly furled the skirts of our jackets into the sails, so that we hung there, reefed fast in the howling gale, a warning example to all drunken tars. However, the mast did not go overboard, and by and by we scrambled down, so sober that we had to pass the flip again, though the savage salt spray bursting down the forecastle scuttle rather too much diluted and pickled it to my taste. The beef was fine, tough but with body in it. They said it was bull beef, others that it was dromedary beef, but I do not know for certain how that was. 
They had dumplings, too, small but substantial, symmetrically globular, and indestructible dumplings. I fancied you could feel them, and roll them about in you after they were swallowed. If you stooped over too far forward, you risked their pitching out of you like billiard balls. The bread... But that couldn't be helped. Besides, it was an anti-scorbutic. In short, the bread contained the only fresh fare they had. But the forecastle was not very light, and it was very easy to step over into a dark corner when you ate it. But all in all, taking her from truck to helm, considering the dimensions of the cook's boilers, including his own live parchment boilers, fore and aft, I say, the Samuel Enderby was a jolly ship, of good fare and plenty, fine flip and strong, crack fellows all, and capital from boot heels to hat band. But why was it, think you, that the Samuel Enderby, and some other English whalers I know of, not all, though, were such famous hospitable ships, that pass round the beef and the bread and the can and the joke, and were not soon weary of eating and drinking and laughing. I will tell you, the abounding good cheer of these English whalers is a matter for historical research, nor have I been at all sparing of historical whale research when it is seemed needed. The English were preceded in the whale fishery by the Hollanders, Zealanders, and Danes, from whom they derived many terms still extant in the fishery, and what is yet more, their fat old fashions, touching plenty to eat and drink. For, as a general thing, the English merchant ship scrimps her crew, but not so the English whaler. Hence, in the English, this thing of whaling good cheer is not normal and natural, but incidental and particular, and therefore must have some special origin, which is here pointed out, and will be still further elucidated. During my researches in the Leviathanic histories, I stumbled upon an ancient Dutch volume, which, by the musty whaling smell of it, I knew must be about whalers. The title was Dan Koopman, wherefore I concluded that this must be the invaluable memoirs of some Amsterdam cooper in the fishery, as every whale-ship must carry its cooper. I was reinforced in this opinion by seeing that it was the production of one Fitz Swackhammer. But my friend, Dr. Snodhead, a very learned man, professor of low Dutch and high German in the College of Santa Claus and St. Potts, to whom I handed the work for translation, giving him a box of sperm candles for his trouble, this same Dr. Snodhead, so soon as he spied the book, assured me that Dan Koopman did not mean the Cooper, but the Merchant. In short, this ancient and learned low Dutch book treated of the commerce of Holland, and, among other subjects, contained a very interesting account of its whale fishery. And in this chapter it was, headed Smear, or Fat, that I found a long, detailed list of the outfits for the larders and cellars of 180 sail of Dutch whalemen, from which list, translated by Dr. Snodhead, I transcribe the following. 400,000 pounds of beef, 60,000 pounds Friesland pork, 150,000 pounds of stockfish, 550,000 pounds of biscuit, 72,000 pounds of soft bread, 2,800 firkins of butter, 20,000 pounds Texel and Leiden cheese, 144,000 pounds cheese, probably an inferior article, 550 anchors of Geneva, 10,800 barrels of beer. Most statistical tables are parchingly dry in the reading. Not so in the present case, however, where the reader is flooded with whole pipes, barrels, quarts, and gills of good gin and good cheer. At the time I devoted three days to the studious digesting of all this beer, beef, and bread, during which many profound thoughts were incidentally suggested to me, capable of a transcendental and platonic application, and furthermore I compiled supplementary tables of my own, touching the probable quantity of stockfish, etc., consumed by every low Dutch harpooner in that ancient Greenland and Spitzbergen whale fishery. 
In the first place, the amount of butter and Texel and Leyden cheese consumed seems amazing. I impute it, though, to their naturally unctuous natures, being rendered still more unctuous by the nature of their vocation, and especially by their pursuing their game in those frigid polar seas, on the very coasts of that Eskimo country where the convivial natives pledge each other in bumpers of train oil. The quantity of beer, too, is very large, 10,800 barrels. Now, as those polar fisheries could only be prosecuted in the short summer of that climate, so that the whole crews of one of these Dutch whalemen, including the short voyage to and from the Spitsbergen Sea, did not much exceed three months, say, and reckoning thirty men to each of their fleet of 180 sail, we have 5,400 low Dutch seamen in all. Therefore, I say, we have precisely two barrels of beer per man for a twelve weeks allowance, exclusive of his fair proportion of that 550 anchors of gin. Now, whether these gin and beer harpooners, so fuddled as one might fancy them to have been, were the right sort of men to stand up in a boat's head and take good aim at flying whales, this would seem somewhat improbable. Yet they did aim at them, and hit them too. But this was very far north, be it remembered, where beer agrees well with the constitution. Upon the equator, in our southern fishery, beer would be apt to make the harpooner sleepy at the masthead and boozy in his boat, and grievous loss might ensue to Nantucket and New Bedford. But no more. Enough has been said to show that the old Dutch whalers of two or three centuries ago were high livers, and that the English whalers have not neglected so excellent an example. For, say they, when cruising in an empty ship, if you can get nothing better out of the world, get a good dinner out of it at least. And this empties the decanter. Chapter 102 a bower in the Arsacides. Hitherto, in descriptively treating of the sperm whale, I have chiefly dwelt upon the marvels of his outer aspect, or separately and in detail upon some few interior structural features. But to a large and thorough sweeping comprehension of him, it behooves me now to unbutton him still further and untagging the points of his hose, unbuckling his garters, and casting loose the hooks and eyes of the joints of his innermost bones, set him before you in his ultimatum, that is to say, in his unconditional skeleton. But how now, Ishmael? How is it that you, a mere oarsman in the fishery, pretend to know aught about the subterranean parts of the whale? Did erudite Stubb, mounted upon your capstan, deliver lectures on the anatomy of the cetacea, and, by help of the windlass, hold up a specimen rib for exhibition? Explain thyself, Ishmael. Can you land a full-grown whale on your deck for examination, as a cook dishes a roast pig? Surely not. A veritable witness have you hitherto been, Ishmael, but have a care how you seize the privilege of Jonah alone the privilege of discoursing upon the joists and beams, the rafters, ridge-poles, sleepers, and underpinnings, making up the framework of the Leviathan, and be like of the tallow-vats, dairy-rooms, butteries, and cheeseries in his bowels. I confess that since Jonah few whalemen have penetrated very far beneath the skin of the adult whale. Nevertheless I have been blessed with an opportunity to dissect him in miniature, in a ship I belonged to, a small cub sperm whale was once bodily hoisted to the deck for his poke, or bag, to make sheaths for the barbs of the harpoons, and for the heads of the lances. Think you I let that chance go, without using my boat hatchet and jackknife, and breaking the seal, and reading all the contents of that young cub? And as for my exact knowledge of the bones of the leviathan in their gigantic, full-grown development, for that rare knowledge I am indebted to my late royal friend Tranquo, king of Tranc, one of the Arsacides. For being at Tranc, years ago, when attached to the trading ship Day of Algiers, I was invited to spend part of the Arsacidean holidays with the lord of Tranc at his retired palm villa at Pupella, 
a seaside glen not very far distant from what our sailors called Bamboo Town, his capital. Among many other fine qualities, my royal friend Tranquo, being gifted with a devout love for all matters of barbaric vertu, had brought together in Pupella whatever rare things the more ingenious of his people could invent, chiefly carved woods of wonderful devices, chiseled shells, inlaid spears, costly paddles, aromatic canoes, and all these distributed among whatever natural wonders the wonder-freighted, tribute-rendering waves had cast upon his shores. Chief among the latter was a great sperm-whale, which, after an unusually long, raging gale, had been found dead and stranded, with his head against a coconut tree, whose plumage-like tufted droopings seemed his verdant jet. When the vast body had at last been stripped of its fathom-deep enfoldings, and the bones became dust-dry in the sun, then the skeleton was carefully transported up the Pupella Glen, where a grand temple of lordly palms now sheltered it. The ribs were hung with trophies, the vertebrae were carved with Arsacidean annals, in strange hieroglyphics, in the skull the priests kept up an unextinguished aromatic flame, so that the mystic head again sent forth its vapory spout, while suspended from a bough, the terrific lower jaw vibrated over all the devotees, like the hair-hung sword that so affrighted Damocles. It was a wondrous sight. The wood was green as mosses of the icy glen. The trees stood high and haughty, feeling their living sap. The industrious earth beneath was as a weaver's loom, with a gorgeous carpet on it, whereof the ground-vine tendrils formed the warp and woof, and the living flowers the figures. All the trees, with all their laden branches, all the shrubs and ferns and grasses, the message-carrying air, all these unceasingly were active. Through the lacings of the leaves the great sun seemed a flying shuttle, weaving the unwearied verdure. O oh, busy weaver, unseen weaver, pause, one word, whither flows the fabric, what palace may it deck, wherefore all these ceaseless toilings, speak, weaver, stay thy hand, but one single word with thee. Nay, the shuttle flies, the figures float from forth the loom, the freshet rushing carpet forever slides away, the weaver god, he weaves, and by that weaving is he deafened, that he hears no mortal voice. And by that humming, we too who look on the loom are deafened, and only when we escape it shall we hear the thousand voices that speak through it. For even so it is in all material factories, the spoken words that are inaudible among the flying spindles, those same words are plainly heard without the walls, bursting from the opened casements. Thereby have villainies been detected. Ah, mortal, then be heedful, for so in all this din of the great world's loom thy subtlest thinkings may be overheard afar. Now amid the green, life-restless loom of that Arsacidean wood, the great, white, worshipped skeleton lay lounging, a gigantic idler, Yet, as the ever-woven, verdant warp and woof intermixed and hummed around him, the mighty idler seemed the cunning weaver, himself all woven over with the vines, every month assuming greener, fresher verdure, but himself a skeleton. Life folded death, death trellised life, the grim god wived with youthful life, and begat him curly-headed glories. Now when with the royal Tranquo I visited this wondrous whale, and saw the skull and altar and the artificial smoke ascending from where the real jet had issued, I marveled that the king should regard a chapel as an object of vertu. He laughed. But more I marveled that the priest should swear that smoky jet of his was genuine. To and fro I paced before this skeleton, brushed the vines aside, broke through the ribs, and with a ball of Arsacidean twine, wandered, eddied long amid its many winding, shaded colonnades and arbors. But soon my line was out, and following it back, I emerged from the opening where I entered. I saw no living thing within. Naught was there but bones. 
cutting me a green measuring rod, I once more dived within the skeleton. From their arrow slit in the skull, the priests perceived me taking the altitude of the final rib. How now, they shouted, darest thou measure this, our god? That's for us. Aye, priests, well, how long do you make him, then? But hereupon a fierce contest rose among them, concerning feet and inches. They cracked each other's sconces with their yardsticks. The great skull echoed, and seizing that lucky chance, I quickly concluded my own admeasurements. These admeasurements I now propose to set before you. But first be it recorded that, in this matter, I am not free to utter any fancied measurement I please, because there are skeleton authorities you can refer to to test my accuracy. There is a Leviathanic Museum, they tell me, in Hull, England, one of the whaling ports of that country, where they have some fine specimens of finbacks and other whales. Likewise I have heard that in the Museum of Manchester in New Hampshire, they have what the proprietors call, quote, the only perfect specimen of a Greenland or river whale in the United States, end quote. Moreover, at a place in Yorkshire, England, Burton Constable by name, a certain Sir Clifford Constable has in his possession the skeleton of a sperm whale, but of moderate size, by no means of the full-grown magnitude of my friend King Tranquo's. In both cases the stranded whales to which these two skeletons belonged were originally claimed by their proprietors upon similar grounds, King Tranquo seizing his because he wanted it, and Sir Clifford because he was lord of the seigneuries in those parts. Sir Clifford's whale has been articulated throughout, so that like a great chest of drawers you can open and shut him in all of his bony cavities, spread out his ribs like a gigantic fan, and swing all day upon his lower jaw. Locks are to be put upon some of his trap doors and shutters, and a footman will show round future visitors with a bunch of keys at his side. Sir Clifford thinks of charging tuppence for a peep at the whispering gallery in the spinal column, threepence to hear the echo of the hollow of his cerebellum, and sixpence for the unrivalled view from his forehead. The skeleton dimensions I shall now proceed to set down are copied verbatim from my right arm, where I had them tattooed, as in my wild wanderings at that period there was no other secure way of preserving such valuable statistics, but as I was crowded for space, and wished the other parts of my body to remain a blank page for a poem I was then composing, at least what untattooed parts might remain, I did not trouble myself with the odd inches, nor indeed should inches at all enter into a congenial admeasurement of the whale. Chapter 103. Measurement of the Whale's Skeleton in the first place, I wish to lay before you a particular plain statement touching the living bulk of this leviathan, whose skeleton we are briefly to exhibit. Such a statement may prove useful here. According to a careful calculation I have made, and which I partly base upon Captain Scoresby's estimate of seventy tons for the largest size Greenland whale of sixty feet in length, According to my careful calculation, I say, a sperm whale of the largest magnitude, between eighty-five and ninety feet in length, and something less than forty feet in its fullest circumference, such a whale will weigh at least ninety tons, so that reckoning thirteen men to a ton, he would considerably outweigh the combined population of a whole village of one thousand one hundred inhabitants. Think you not, then, that brains, like yoked cattle, should be put to this leviathan, to make him at all budge to any landsman's imagination? Having already in various ways put before you his skull, spout-hole, jaw, teeth, tail, forehead, fins, and diverse other parts, I shall now simply point out what is most interesting in the general bulk of his unobstructed bones— but as the colossal skull embraces so very large a proportion of the entire extent of the skeleton, as it is by far the most complicated part, 
and as nothing is to be repeated concerning it in this chapter, you must not fail to carry it in your mind, or under your arm, as we proceed, otherwise you will not gain a complete notion of the general structure we are about to view. In length, the sperm whale's skeleton at Trank measured seventy-two feet, so that when fully invested and extended in life, he must have been ninety feet long, for in the whale the skeleton loses about one-fifth in length compared with the living body. Of this seventy-two feet, his skull and jaw comprised some twenty feet, leaving some fifty feet of plain backbone. Attached to this backbone, for something less than a third of its length, was the mighty circular basket of ribs which once enclosed his vitals. To me this vast ivory-ribbed chest, with the long unrelieved spine, extending far away from it in a straight line, not a little resembled the hull of a great ship new laid upon the stocks, when only some twenty of her naked bow-ribs are inserted, and the keel is otherwise, for the time, but a long disconnected timber. The ribs were ten on a side. The first, to begin from the neck, was nearly six feet long, the second, third, and fourth were each successively longer, till you came to the climax of the fifth, or one of the middle ribs, which measured eight feet and some inches. From that part the remaining ribs diminished, till the tenth and last only spanned five feet and some inches. In general thickness they all bore a seemly correspondence to their length, the middle ribs were the most arched. In some of the arsacides they are used for beams, whereon to lay footpath bridges over small streams. In considering these ribs I could not but be struck anew, with the circumstance, so variously repeated in this book, that the skeleton of the whale is by no means the mould of his invested form. The largest of the trank ribs, one of the middle ones, occupied that part of the fish which, in life, is greatest in depth. Now the greatest depth of the invested body of this particular whale must have been at least sixteen feet, whereas the corresponding rib measured but little more than eight feet, so that this rib only conveyed half of the true notion of the living magnitude of that part. Besides, for some way, where I now saw but a naked spine, all that had been once wrapped round with tons of added bulk in flesh, muscle, blood, and bowels. Still more, for the ample fins, I here saw but a few disordered joints, and, in place of the weighty and majestic, but boneless flukes, an utter blank. How vain and foolish, then, thought I, for timid, untravelled man to try to comprehend aright this wondrous wail by merely poring over his dead, attenuated skeleton, stretched in this peaceful wood. No, only in the heart of quickest perils, only when within the eddyings of his angry flukes, only on the profound, unbounded sea can the fully invested wail be truly and livingly found out but the spine, for that the best way we can consider it is, with a crane, to pile its bones high up on end. No speedy enterprise, but now it's done, it looks much like Pompey's pillar. There are forty and odd vertebrae in all, which in the skeleton are not locked together. They mostly lie like the great knobbed blocks on a gothic spire, forming solid courses of heavy masonry. The largest, a middle one, is in width something less than three feet, and in depth more than four. The smallest, where the spine tapers away into the tail, is only two inches in width, and looks something like a white billiard ball. I was told that there were still smaller ones, but that they had been lost by some little cannibal urchins, the priest's children, who had stolen them to play marbles with. Thus we see how that the spine of even the hugest of living things tapers off at last into simple child's play. Chapter 104 The Fossil Whale From his mighty bulk the whale affords a most congenial theme whereon to enlarge, amplify, and generally expatiate. Would you, you could not compress him. By good rights he should only be treated of in imperial folio. 
not to tell over again his furlongs from spiracle to tail, and the yards he measures about the waist, only think of the gigantic involutions of his intestines, where they lie in him like great cables and hawsers coiled away in the subterranean orlop deck of a line of battleship. Since I have undertaken to manhandle this leviathan, it behooves me to approve myself omnisciently exhaustive in the enterprise, not overlooking the minutest seminal germs of his blood, and spinning him out to the uttermost coil of his bowels. Having already described him in most of his present habitatory and anatomical peculiarities, it now remains to magnify him in an archaeological, fossiliferous, and antediluvian point of view. Applied to any other creature than the leviathan, to an ant or a flea, such portly terms might justly be deemed unwarrantably grandiloquent. But when leviathan is the text, the case is altered. Fain am I to stagger to this emprise under the weightiest words of the dictionary. And here be it said, that whenever it has been convenient to consult one in the course of these dissertations, I have invariably used a huge quarto edition of Johnson, expressly purchased for that purpose, because that famous lexicographer's uncommon personal bulk more than fitted him to compile a lexicon to be used by a whale author like me. One often hears of writers that rise and swell with their subject, though it may seem but an ordinary one. How then with me writing of this leviathan? Unconsciously my chirography expands into placard capitals. Give me a condor's quill. Give me Vesuvius's crater for an inkstand. Friends, hold my arms. For in the mere act of penning my thoughts of this leviathan, they weary me, and make me faint with their outreaching comprehensiveness of sweep, as if to include the whole circle of the sciences, and all the generations of whales, and men, and mastodons, past, present, and to come, with all the revolving panoramas of empire on earth, and throughout the whole universe, not excluding its suburbs. Such and so magnifying is the virtue of a large and liberal theme. We expand to its bulk. To produce a mighty book, you must choose a mighty theme. No great and enduring volume can ever be written on the flea, though many there be who have tried it. Ere entering upon the subject of fossil whales, I present my credentials as a geologist, by stating that in my miscellaneous time I have been a stonemason, and also a great digger of ditches, canals, and wells, wine vaults, and cellars, and cisterns of all sorts. Likewise, by way of preliminary, I desire to remind the reader that while in the earlier geological strata there are found fossils of monsters now almost completely extinct, the subsequent relics discovered in what are called the tertiary formations seem the connecting, or at any rate intercepted, links between the antichronical creatures and those whose remote posterity are said to have entered the ark. All the fossil whales hitherto discovered belong to the tertiary period, which is the last preceding the superficial formations. And, though none of them precisely answer to any known species of the present time, they are yet sufficiently akin to them in general respects to justify their taking rank as cetacean fossils. Detached broken fossils of pre-Adamite whales, fragments of their bones and skeletons, have within thirty years past, at various intervals, been found at the base of the Alps, in Lombardy, in France, in England, in Scotland, and in the states of Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama. Among the more curious of such remains is part of a skull, which in the year 1779 was disinterred in the Rue Dauphin in Paris, a short street opening almost directly upon the palace of the Tuileries, and bones disinterred in excavating the great docks of Antwerp in Napoleon's time. Cuvier pronounced these fragments to have belonged to some utterly unknown leviathanic species. But by far the most wonderful of all cetacean relics was the almost complete vast skeleton of an extinct monster found in the year 1842 on the plantation of Judge Cree in Alabama. 
the awe-stricken, credulous slaves in the vicinity took it for the bones of one of the fallen angels. The Alabama doctors declared it a huge reptile, and bestowed upon it the name of Basilosaurus. But some specimen bones of it being taken across the sea to Owen, the English anatomist, it turned out that this alleged reptile was a whale, though of a departed species. A significant illustration of the fact, again and again repeated in this book, that the skeleton of the whale furnishes but little clue to the shape of his fully invested body. So Owen rechristened the monster Zuglodon, and in his paper, read before the London Geological Society, pronounced it in substance one of the most extraordinary creatures which the mutations of the globe have blotted out of existence. When I stand among these mighty leviathan skeletons, skulls, tusks, jaws, ribs, and vertebrae, all characterized by partial resemblances to the existing breeds of sea monsters, but at the same time bearing, on the other hand, similar affinities to the annihilated anti-chronical leviathans, their incalculable seniors, I am, by a flood, born back to that wondrous period, ere time itself can be said to have begun, for time began with man. Here Saturn's grey chaos rolls over me, and I obtain dim, shuddering glimpses into those polar eternities, when wedged bastions of ice pressed hard upon what are now the tropics, and in all the twenty-five thousand miles of this world's circumference, not an inhabitable hand's breadth of land was visible. Then the whole world was the whales, and, king of creation, he left his wake along the present lines of the Andes and the Himalayas. Who can show a pedigree like Leviathan? Ahab's harpoon had shed older blood than the pharaohs. Methuselah seems a schoolboy. I look round to shake hands with Shem. I am horror-struck at this anti-mosaic, unsourced existence of the unspeakable terrors of the whale, which, having been before all time, must needs exist after all humane ages are over. But not alone has this leviathan left his pre-Adamite traces in the stereotype plates of nature, and in limestone and marl bequeathed his ancient bust. But upon Egyptian tablets, whose antiquity seems to claim for them an almost fossiliferous character, we find the unmistakable print of his fin. In an apartment of the great temple of Dendera, some fifty years ago, there was discovered upon the granite ceiling a sculptured and painted planisphere abounding in centaurs, griffins, and dolphins, similar to the grotesque figures on the celestial globe of the moderns. Gliding among them, old leviathans swam as of yore, was there swimming in that planisphere centuries before Solomon was cradled. Nor must there be omitted another strange attestation of the antiquity of the whale, in his own osseous post-diluvian reality, as set down by the venerable John Leo, the old Barbary traveller. Quote, Not far from the seaside they have a temple, the rafters and beams of which are made of whale bones, for whales of a monstrous size are oftentimes cast up dead upon that shore. The common people imagine that by a secret power bestowed by God upon the temple, no whale can pass it without immediate death. But the truth of the matter is that on either side of the temple there are rocks that shoot two miles into the sea, and wound the whales when they light upon them. They keep a whale's rib of an incredible length for a miracle, which lying upon the ground with its convex part uppermost makes an arch, the head of which cannot be reached by a man upon a camel's back. This rib, says John Leo, is said to have lain there a hundred years before I saw it. Their historians affirm that a prophet who prophesied of Mahomet came from this temple, and some do not stand to assert that the prophet Jonas was cast forth by the whale at the base of the temple. End quote. In this Afric temple of the whale I leave you, reader, and if you be a Nantucketer and a whaleman, you will silently worship there. End of chapters 101 to 104 Chapter 105 does the whale's magnitude diminish? Will he perish? 
Inasmuch, then, as this Leviathan comes floundering down upon us from the headwaters of the eternities, it may be fitly inquired whether, in the long course of his generations, he has not degenerated from the original bulk of his sires. But upon investigation we find that not only are the whales of the present day superior in magnitude to those whose fossil remains are found in the tertiary system, embracing a distinct geological period prior to man, but of the whales found in that tertiary system, those belonging to its latter formations exceed in size those of its earlier ones. Of all the pre-Adamite whales yet exhumed, by far the largest is the Alabama one mentioned in the last chapter, and that was less than seventy feet in length in the skeleton, whereas we have already seen that the tape measure gives seventy-two feet for the skeleton of a large-sized modern whale, and I have heard on whalemen's authority that sperm whales have been captured near a hundred feet long at the time of capture. But may it not be that while the whales of the present hour are an advance in magnitude upon those of all previous geological periods, may it not be that since Adam's time they have degenerated? Assuredly we must conclude so, if we are to credit the accounts of such gentlemen as Pliny and the ancient naturalists generally. For Pliny tells us of whales that embraced acres of living bulk, and Aldrovandus of others which measured eight hundred feet in length, rope-walks and Thames tunnels of whales, and even in the days of Banks and Salander, Cook's naturalists, we find a Danish member of the Academy of Sciences setting down certain Iceland whales, Raiden Sisker or Wrinkled Bellies, at one hundred and twenty yards, that is, three hundred and sixty feet and Lassipade, the French naturalist, in his elaborate history of whales, in the very beginning of his work, page 3, sets down the right whale at 100 meters, 328 feet, and this work was published so late as A.D. 1825. But will any whaleman believe these stories? No. The whale of today is as big as his ancestors in Pliny's times, and if ever I go where Pliny is, I, a whaleman, more than he was, will make bold to tell him so. Because I cannot understand how it is, that while the Egyptian mummies that were buried thousands of years before even Pliny was born do not measure so much in their coffins as a modern Kentuckian in his socks, and while the cattle and other animals sculptured on the oldest Egyptian and Nineveh tablets by the relative proportions in which they are drawn, just as plainly prove that the high-bred, stall-fed, prize cattle of Smithfield not only equal, but far exceed in magnitude the fattest of Pharaoh's fat kine. In the face of all this, I will not admit that of all animals the whale alone should have degenerated." But still another inquiry remains, one often agitated by the more recondite Nantucketers. Whether owing to the almost omniscient lookouts at the mastheads of the whale ships, now penetrating even through Bering Straits and into the remotest secret drawers and lockers of the world, and the thousand harpoons and lances darted along all continental coasts, the moot point is whether Leviathan can long endure so wide a chase, and so remorseless a havoc, whether he must not at last be exterminated from the waters, and the last whale, like the last man, smoke his last pipe, and then himself evaporate in the final puff. Comparing the humped herds of whales with the humped herds of buffalo, which not forty years ago overspread by tens of thousands, the prairies of Illinois and Missouri, and shook their iron manes, and scowled with their thunder-clotted brows upon the sites of populous river capitals, where now the polite broker sells you land at a dollar an inch, in such a comparison an irresistible argument would seem furnished to show that the hunted whale cannot now escape speedy extinction. But you must look at this matter in every light. Though so short a period ago, not a good lifetime, the census of the buffalo in Illinois exceeded the census of men now in London, 
and though at the present day not one horn or hoof of them remains in all that region, and though the cause of this wondrous extermination was the spear of man, yet the far different nature of the whale-hunt peremptorily forbids so inglorious an end to the leviathan. Forty men in one ship hunting the sperm-whales for forty-eight months think that they have done extremely well, and thank God if at last they carry home the oil of forty fish. Whereas in the days of the old Canadian and Indian hunters and trappers of the West, when the far west, in whose sunset suns still rise, was a wilderness and a virgin, the same number of moccasined men for the same number of months, mounted on horse instead of sailing in ships, would have slain not forty, but forty thousand and more buffaloes, a fact that, if need were, could be statistically stated. Nor, considered aright, does it seem any argument in favour of the gradual extinction of the sperm-whale, for example, that in former years, the latter part of the last century, say, these leviathans in small pods were encountered much oftener than at present, and, in consequence, the voyages were not so prolonged, and were also much more remunerative. Because, as has been elsewhere noticed, those whales, influenced by some views to safety, now swim the seas in immense caravans, so that to a large degree the scattered solitaries, yokes, and pods, and schools of other days are now aggregated into vast but widely separated, unfrequent armies. That is all. And equally fallacious seems the conceit, that because the so-called whalebone whales no longer haunt many grounds in former years abounding with them, Hence that species also is declining, for they are only being driven from promontory to cape, and if one coast is no longer enlivened with their jets, then be sure some other and remoter strand has been very recently startled by the unfamiliar spectacle. Furthermore, concerning these last-mentioned leviathans, they have two firm fortresses, which, in all human probability, will forever remain impregnable and as upon the invasion of their valleys the frosty Swiss have retreated to their mountains, so, hunted from the savannas and glades of the middle seas, the whalebone whales can at last resort to their polar citadels, and diving under the ultimate glassy barriers and walls there, come up among icy fields and flows, and in a charmed circle of everlasting December bid defiance to all pursuit from man." But as perhaps fifty of these whalebone whales are harpooned for one cachalot, some philosophers of the forecastle have concluded that this positive havoc has already very seriously diminished their battalions. But though for some time past a number of these whales, not less than thirteen thousand, have been annually slain on the Norwest coast by the Americans alone, yet there are considerations which render even this circumstance of little or no account as an opposing argument in this matter. Natural as it is to be somewhat incredulous concerning the populousness of the more enormous creatures of the globe, yet what shall we say to Harto, the historian of Goa, when he tells us that at one hunting the king of Siam took four thousand elephants, that in those regions elephants are as numerous as droves of cattle in the temperate climes. And there seems no reason to doubt that if these elephants, which have now been hunted for thousands of years by Semiramis, by Porus, by Hannibal, and by all the successive monarchs of the East, if they still survive there in great numbers, much more may the great whale outlast all hunting, since he has a pasture to expatiate in which is precisely twice as large as all Asia, both Americas, Europe, and Africa, New Holland, and all the isles of the sea combined. Moreover, we are to consider that from the presumed great longevity of whales, they are probably attaining an age of a century or more, Therefore, at any one period of time, several distinct adult generations must be contemporary. And what that is, we may soon gain some idea of, by imagining all the graveyards, cemeteries, and family vaults of creation, yielding up the live bodies of all the men, women, and children who were alive seventy-five years ago, 
and adding this countless host to the present human population of the globe. Wherefore, for all these things, we account the whale immortal in his species, however perishable in his individuality. He swam the seas before the continents broke water. He once swam over the site of the Tullieries and Windsor Castle and the Kremlin. In Noah's flood he despised Noah's ark, and if ever the world is to be again flooded, like the Netherlands, to kill off its rats, then the eternal whale will still survive, and rearing upon the topmost crest of the equatorial flood, spout his froth defiance to the skies. Chapter 106 Ahab's Leg The precipitating manner in which Captain Ahab had quitted the Samuel Enderby of London had not been unattended with some small violence to his own person. He had lighted with such energy upon the thwart of his boat that his ivory leg had received a half-splintering shock, and when, after gaining his own deck and his own pivot-hole there, he so vehemently wheeled round with an urgent command to the steersman, it was, as ever, something about his not steering inflexibly enough, then the already shaken ivory received such an additional twist and wrench that though it still remained entire and to all appearances lusty, yet Ahab did not deem it entirely trustworthy. And indeed it seemed small matter for wonder, that for all his pervading mad recklessness, Ahab did at times give careful heed to the condition of that dead bone upon which he partly stood. For it had not been very long prior to the Pequod's sailing from Nantucket, that he had been found one night lying prone upon the ground and insensible, by some unknown and seemingly inexplicable, unimaginable casualty, his ivory limb having been so violently displaced that it had stakewise smitten and all but pierced his groin, nor was it without extreme difficulty that the agonizing wound was entirely cured. Nor at the time had it failed to enter his monomaniac mind, that all the anguish of that then present suffering was but the direct issue of a former woe, and he too plainly seemed to see that as the most poisonous reptile of the marsh perpetuates his kind as inevitably as the sweetest songster of the grove, so equally with every felicity all miserable events do naturally beget their like. Yea, more than equally, thought Ahab, since both the ancestry and posterity of grief go further than the ancestry and posterity of joy. For, not to hint of this, that it is an inference from certain canonic teachings, that while some natural enjoyments here shall have no children born to them for the other world, but, on the contrary, shall be followed by the joy-childlessness of all hell's despair, whereas some guilty mortal miseries shall still fertilely beget to themselves an eternally progressive progeny of griefs beyond the grave, not at all to hint of this, there still seems an inequality in the deeper analysis of the thing. For, thought Ahab, while even the highest earthly felicities have a certain unsignifying pettiness lurking in them, but at bottom all heart-woes, a mystic significance, and in some men an archangelic grandeur, so do their diligent tracings out not belie the obvious deduction. To trail the genealogies of these high mortal miseries carries us at last among the sourceless primogenitors of the gods, so that in the face of all the glad haymaking suns and soft cymbling round harvest moons, we must needs give in to this, that the gods themselves are not forever glad. The ineffaceable sad birthmark in the brow of man is but the stamp of sorrow in the signers. Unwittingly here a secret has been divulged, which perhaps might more properly, in set way, have been disclosed before. With many other particulars concerning Ahab, always had it remained a mystery to some why it was that for a certain period, both before and after the sailing of the Pequod, he had hidden himself away with such grand llama like exclusiveness, and for that one interval sought speechless refuge, as it were, among the marble senate of the dead. Captain Peleg's brooded reason for this thing appeared by no means adequate, 
though indeed as touching all ahab's deeper part every revelation partook more of significant darkness than of explanatory light but in the end it all came out this one matter did at least that direful mishap was at the bottom of his temporary recluseness and not only this but to that ever contracting dropping circle ashore who for any reason possessed the privilege of a less band approach to him to that timid circle the above hinted casualty remaining as it did moodily unaccounted for by ahab invested itself with terrors not entirely underived from the land of spirits and of whales so that through their zeal for him they had all conspired so far as in them lay to muffle up the knowledge of this thing from others and hence it was that not till a considerable interval had elapsed did it transpire upon the pequod's decks but be all this as it may let the unseen ambiguous synod in the air or the vindictive princes and potentates of fire have to do or not with earthly ahab yet in this present matter of his leg he took plain practical procedures he called the carpenter and when that functionary appeared before him he bade him without delay set about making a new leg and directed the mates to see him supplied with all these studs and joists of jaw ivory sperm whale which had thus far been accumulated on the voyage in order that a careful selection of the stoutest clearest grain stuff might be secured this done the carpenter received orders to have the leg completed that night and to provide all the fittings for it independent of those pertaining to the distrusted one in use moreover the ship's forge was ordered to be hoisted out of its temporary idleness in the hold and to accelerate the affair the blacksmith was commanded to proceed at once to the forging of whatever iron contrivances might be needed chapter 107 the carpenter seat thyself sultanically among the moons of saturn and take high abstracted man alone and he seems a wonder a grandeur and a woe but from the same point take mankind in mass and for the most part they seem a mob of unnecessary duplicates both contemporary and hereditary but most humble though he was and far from furnishing an example of the high humane abstraction the pequod's carpenter was no duplicate hence he now comes in person on this stage like all sea-going ship carpenters and more especially those belonging to whaling vessels he was to a certain off-handed practical extent alike experienced in numerous trades and callings collateral to his own the carpenter's pursuit being the ancient and outbranching trunk of all those numerous handicrafts which more or less have to do with wood as an auxiliary material but besides the application to him of the generic remark above this carpenter of the pequod was singularly efficient in those thousand nameless mechanical emergencies continually recurring in a large ship upon a three or four years voyage in uncivilized and far distant seas for not to speak of his readiness in ordinary duties repairing stove boats sprung spars reforming the shape of clumsy bladed oars inserting bull's eyes in the deck or new tree nails in the side planks and other miscellaneous matters more directly pertaining to his special business he was moreover unhesitatingly expert in all manner of conflicting aptitudes both useful and capricious the one grand stage where he enacted all his various parts so manifold was his vice bench a long rude ponderous table furnished with several vices of different sizes and both of iron and of wood at all times except when whales were alongside this bench was securely lashed athwartships against the rear of the triworks a belaying pin is found too large to be easily inserted into its hole the carpenter claps it into one of his ever-ready vices and straightway files it smaller a lost land bird of strange plumage strays on board and is made a captive out of clean-shaved rods of right whalebone and cross-beams of sperm whale ivory the carpenter makes a pagoda-looking cage for it an oarsman sprains his wrist 
the carpenter concocts a soothing lotion. Stubb longed for vermilion stars to be painted upon the blade of his every oar. Screwing each oar in his big vice of wood, the carpenter symmetrically supplies the constellation. A sailor takes a fancy to wear shark-bone earrings. The carpenter drills his ears. Another has a toothache. The carpenter out pincers, and clapping one hand upon his bench, bids him be seated there. But the poor fellow unmanageably winces under the unconcluded operation. Whirling round the handle of his wooden vice, the carpenter signs him to clap his jaw in that, if he would have him draw the tooth. Thus this carpenter was prepared at all points, and alike indifferent and without respect in all. Teeth he accounted bits of ivory, heads he deemed but top-blocks, men themselves he lightly held for capstans. But while now upon so wide a field thus variously accomplished, and with such liveliness of expertness in him too, all this would seem to argue some uncommon vivacity of intelligence. But not precisely so. For nothing was this man more remarkable than for a certain impersonal stolidity, as it were. Impersonal, I say, for it so shaded off into the surrounding infinite of things, that it seemed one with the general stolidity discernible in the whole visible world, which, while pauselessly active in uncounted modes, still eternally holds its peace, and ignores you, though you dig foundations for cathedrals. Yet was this half-horrible stolidity in him, involving too, as it appeared, an all-ramifying heartlessness, yet was it oddly dashed at times with an old, crutch-like, antediluvian, wheezing humorousness, not unstreaked now and then with a certain grizzled wittiness, such as might have served to pass the time during the midnight watch on the bearded forecastle of Noah's Ark, was it that this old carpenter had been a lifelong wanderer, whose much rolling to and fro not only had gathered no moss, but, what is more, had rubbed off whatever small outward clingings might have originally pertained to him? He was a stripped abstract, an unfractioned integral, uncompromised as a newborn babe, living without premeditated reference to this world or the next, you might almost say that this strange uncompromisedness in him involved a sort of unintelligence, for in his numerous trades he did not seem to work so much by reason or by instinct, or simply because he had been tutored to it, or by any intermixture of all these, even or uneven, but merely by a kind of deaf and dumb spontaneous literal process. He was a pure manipulator, his brain, if he had ever had one, must have early oozed along into the muscles of his fingers. He was like one of those unreasoning but still highly useful, multum in parvo, Sheffield contrivances, assuming the exterior, though a little swelled, of a common pocket-knife, but containing not only blades of various sizes, but also screwdrivers, corkscrews, tweezers, awls, pens, rulers, nail-filers, countersinkers. So, if his superiors wanted to use the carpenter for a screwdriver, all they had to do was to open that part of him and the screw was fast, or if for tweezers, take him up by the legs, and there they were. Yet, as previously hinted, this omnitooled open-and-shut carpenter was, after all, no mere machine of an automaton. If he did not have a common soul in him, he had a subtle something that somehow anomalously did its duty. What that was, whether essence of quicksilver or a few drops of hartshorn, there was no telling. But there it was, and there it had abided for now some sixty years or more. And this it was, this same unaccountable, cunning, life-principle in him, this it was that kept him a great part of the time soliloquizing, but only like an unreasoning wheel, which also hummingly soliloquizes. Or, rather, his body was a sentry-box, and this soliloquizer on guard there, and talking all the time to keep himself awake. CHAPTER 108 Ahab and the Carpenter The Deck First Night Watch Carpenter standing before his vice-bench, and by the light of two lanterns, busily filing the ivory joist for the leg, 
which joist is firmly fixed in the vice. Slabs of ivory, leather straps, pads, screws, and various tools of all sorts lying about the bench. Forward, the red flame of the forge is seen, where the blacksmith is at work. Drat the file, and drat the bone. That is hard which should be soft, and that is soft which should be hard. So we go, who file old jaws and shin bones. Let's try another. Aye, now this works better. Sneezes. Hello, this bone dust is... Sneezes. Why, it's... Sneezes. Yes, it's... Sneezes. Bless my soul, it won't let me speak. That is what an old fellow gets now for working in dead lumber. Saw a live tree, and you don't get this dust. Amputate a live bone, and you don't get it. Sneezes. Come, come, you, old smut, there, bear a hand, and let's have that ferrule and buckle screw. I'll be ready for them presently. Lucky now, sneezes, there's no knee joint to make. That might puzzle a little, but a mere shin bone, why, it's as easy as making hop poles, only I should like to put a good finish on. Time, time, if I but only had the time, I could turn him out as neat a leg now as ever, sneezes, scraped to a lady in a parlor. Those buckskin legs and calves of legs I've seen in shop windows wouldn't compare at all. They soak water, they do, and of course get rheumatic, and have to be doctored, sneezes, with washes and lotions, just like live legs. There, before I saw it off now, I must call his old mogul ship, and see whether the length will be all right. Too short, if anything, I guess. Ha! That's the heel. We are in luck. Here he comes. Or it's somebody else, that's certain. Ahab, advancing. During the ensuing scene, the carpenter continues, sneezing at times. Well, man-maker? Just in time, sir. Uh, if the captain pleases, I will now mark the length. Let me measure, sir. Measured for a leg. <laughs> Good. Well, it's not the first time. About it. There, keep thy finger on it. This is a cogent vice thou hast here, carpenter. Let me feel its grip once. So, so, it does pinch some. Oh, sir, it will break bones. Beware, beware. No fear. I like a good grip. I like to feel something in this slippery world that can hold man. What's Prometheus about there? The blacksmith, I mean. What's he about? He must be forging the buckle screw, sir, now. Right. It's a partnership. He supplies the muscle part. He makes a fierce red flame there. Aye, sir. He must have the white heat for this kind of fine work. Hmm. So he must. I do deem it now a most meaning thing, that this old Greek Prometheus, who made men, they say, should have been a blacksmith, and animated them with fire. For what's made in fire must properly belong to fire, and so hell's probable. How the soot flies! This must be the remainder the Greek made the Africans of. Carpenter, when he's through with that buckle... Tell him to forge a pair of steel shoulder blades. There's a peddler aboard with a crushing pack. Sir? Hold. While Prometheus is about it, I'll order a complete man after a desirable pattern. Imprimus, fifty feet high in his socks. Then chest modeled after the Thames Tunnel. Then legs with roots to him to stay in one place. Then arms three feet through the wrist no heart at all, brass forehead, and about a quarter of an acre of fine brains. And let me see. Shall I order eyes to see outwards? No, but put a skylight on top of his head to illuminate inwards. There, take the order and away. Now what's he speaking about, and who's he speaking to? I should like to know. Uh, shall I keep standing here? Aside, tis but indifferent architecture to make a blind dome. Here's one. No, 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 I must have a lantern. Ho, ho, 
That's it, eh? Here are two, sir. Uh, one will serve my turn. What art thou thrusting that thief-catcher into my face for, man? Thrusted light is worse than presented pistols. I thought, sir, that you spoke to Carpenter. Carpenter! Why, that's... But no. A very tidy, and, I may say, an extremely gentlemanlike sort of business thou art in here, Carpenter. Or wouldst thou rather work in clay? Sir, clay? Uh, clay, sir, that's mud. We, we leave clay to ditchers, sir. The fellow's impious. What art thou sneezing about? A bone is rather dusty, sir. Take the hint, then, and when thou art dead, never bury thyself under living people's noses. Sir? Oh, uh, uh, I guess so. Uh, yes. Dear. Look ye, carpenter. I dare say thou callest thyself a right good workmanlike workman, eh? Well, then, will it speak thoroughly well for thy work, if, when I come to mount this leg thou makest, I shall nevertheless feel another leg in the same identical place with it? That is, carpenter, my old lost leg, the flesh and blood one, I mean. Canst thou not drive that old Adam away? Truly, sir, I begin to understand somewhat now. Yes, I have heard something curious on that score, sir, how a dismasted man never entirely loses the feeling of his old spar, but it will be still pricking him at times. May I humbly ask if it really be so, sir? It is, man. Look, put thy live leg here in the place where mine once was. So, now, here is only one distinct leg to the eye, yet two to the soul. Where thou feelest tingling life, there, exactly there, there to a hair, do I. Is it a riddle? I should humbly call it a poser, sir. Hiss, then. How dost thou know that some entire living, thinking thing may not be invisibly and uninterpenetratingly standing precisely where thou now standest, I and standing there in thy spite? In thy most solitary hours, then, dost thou not fear eavesdroppers? Hold! Don't speak. And if I still feel the smart of my crushed leg, though it be now so long dissolved, then why mayest not thou, carpenter, feel the fiery pains of hell forever, and without a body? Ha! Huh? Good Lord! Truly, sir, if it comes to that, I must calculate over again. I think I didn't carry a small figure, sir. Look ye, pudding head should never grant premises. How long before the leg is done? Perhaps an hour, sir. Bungle away at it, then, and bring it to me turns to go. Oh, life! Here I am, proud as a Greek god, and yet standing debtor to this blockhead for a bone to stand on. Cursed be that mortal inter-indebtedness which will not do away with ledgers. I would be free as air, and I'm down in the whole world's books. I am so rich I could have given bid for bid with the wealthiest Praetorians at the auction of the Roman Empire, which was the world's, and yet I owe for the flesh in the tongue I brag with. By heavens, I'll get a crucible, and into it, and dissolve myself down to one small compendious vertebra. So. Carpenter, resuming his work. Well, well, well. Stubb knows him best of all, and Stubb always says he's queer. Says nothing but that one sufficient little word. Queer. He's queer, says Stubb. He's queer. 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 And keeps dinning it into Mr. Starbuck all the time. Queer, sir. Queer. Queer. Very queer. And here's his leg. Yes, now that I think of it. Here's his bedfellow. He has a stick of whale's jawbone for a wife. And this is his leg. He'll stand on this. What was that now about one leg standing in three places, and all the three places standing in one hell? How was that? Oh, I don't wonder he looked so scornful at me. 
I'm a sort of strange thoughted sometimes, they say, but that's only haphazard like. Then a short little old body like me should never undertake to wade out into deep waters with tall heron built captains. The water chucks you under the chin pretty quick, and there's a great cry for lifeboats. And here's the heron's leg, long and slim, sure enough. Now, for most folks, one pair of legs lasts a lifetime and that must be because they use them mercifully as a tender-hearted old lady uses her roly-poly old coach-horses but ahab oh he's a hard driver look driven one leg to death and spavined the other for life and now wears out bone legs by the cord hallo there you smut bear a hand there with those screws and let's finish it before the resurrection fellow comes a-calling with his horn for all legs, true or false, as brewery men go round collecting old beer-barrels to fill em up again. What a leg this is! It looks like a real live leg, filed down to nothing but the core. He'll be standing on this to-morrow. He'll be taking altitudes on it. Ah, hello! I almost forgot the little oval slate smoothed ivory where he figures up the latitude so so chisel file and sandpaper now end of chapters 105 to 108 chapter 109 ahab and starbuck in the cabin according to usage they were pumping the ship the next morning and lo no inconsiderable oil came up with the water the casks below must have sprung a bad leak. Much concern was shown, and Starbuck went down into the cabin to report this unfavorable affair. Footnote. In sperm whalemen, with any considerable quantity of oil on board, it is a regular semi-weekly duty to conduct a hose into the hold and drench the casks with seawater, which afterwards at varying intervals is removed by the ship's pumps. Hereby the casks are sought to be kept damply tight, while, by the changed character of the withdrawn water, the mariners readily detect any serious leakage in the precious cargo. End of footnote. Now, from the south and west, the Pequod was drawing nigh to Formosa and the Bashi Isles, between which lies one of the tropical outlets from the China waters into the Pacific and so starbuck found ahab with a general chart of the oriental archipelago spread before him and another separate one representing the long eastern coasts of the japanese islands nifan matsmai and sikoke with his snow-white new ivory leg braced against the screwed leg of his table and with a long pruning hook of a jackknife in his hand the wondrous old man, with his back to the gangway door, was wrinkling his brow and tracing his old courses again. "'Who's there?' hearing the footstep at the door, but not turning round to it. "'On deck! Be gone!' "'Captain Ahab mistakes. It is I. The oil in the hold is leaking, sir. We must up Burton's and break out.' "'Up Burton's and break out! Now that we are nearing Japan!' Heave to here for a week to tinker a parcel of old hoops? Either do that, sir, or waste in one day more oil than we may make good in a year. What we come twenty thousand miles to get is worth saving, sir. So it is, so it is, if we get it. I was speaking of the oil in the hold, sir. And I was not speaking or thinking of that at all. Be gone! Let it leak! I'm all a leak myself. I leaks in leaks, not only full of leaky casks, but those leaky casks are in a leaky ship, and that's a far worse plight than the Pequod's man. Yet I don't stop to plug my leak, for who can find it in the deep-loaded hull, or how hope to plug it, even if found in this life's howling gale? Starbuck, I'll not have the Burtons hoisted. What will the owners say, sir? Let the owners stand on Nantucket Beach and out-yell the typhoons. What cares Ahab? Owners! Owners! Thou art always prating to me, Starbuck, about those miserly owners, as if the owners were my conscience. 
But look ye, the only real owner of anything is its commander, and hark ye, my conscience is in this ship's keel. On deck! Captain Ahab, said the reddening mate, moving further into the cabin, with a daring so strangely respectful and cautious, that it almost seemed not only every way seeking to avoid the slightest outward manifestation of itself, but within also seemed more than half distrustful of itself. A better man than I might well pass over in thee, what he would quickly enough resent in a younger man, I, and in a happier, Captain Ahab. Devils! Dost thou then so much as dare to critically think of me? On deck! Nay, sir, not yet. I do entreat, and I do dare, sir, to be forbearing. Shall we not understand each other better than hitherto, Captain Ahab? Ahab seized a loaded musket from the rack, forming part of most South Seamen's cabin furniture, and, pointing it towards Starbuck, exclaimed, there is one God that is Lord over the earth, and one Captain that is Lord over the Pequod, on deck. For an instant, in the flashing eyes of the mate, and his fiery cheeks, you would have almost thought that he had really received the blaze of the leveled tube. But, mastering his emotion, he half calmly rose, and as he quitted the cabin, paused for an instant, and said, Thou hast outraged, not insulted me, sir. But for that I ask thee not to beware of Starbuck. Thou wouldst but laugh. But let Ahab beware of Ahab. Beware of thyself, old man. He waxes brave, but nevertheless obeys. <laughs> Most careful bravery, that, murmured Ahab, as Starbuck disappeared. What's that he said? Ahab, beware of Ahab. There's something there. Then, unconsciously using the musket for a staff, with an iron brow he paced to and fro in the little cabin. But presently the thick pleats of his forehead relaxed, and returning the gun to the rack, he went on deck. Thou art but too good a fellow, Starbuck, he said lowly to the mate. Then raising his voice to the crew, Furl the t'gallant sails, and close reef the topsails, fore and aft. Back the main yard. Up Burton's, and break out in the main hold. It were perhaps vain to surmise exactly why it was that, as respecting Starbuck, Ahab thus acted. It may have been a flash of honesty in him, or a mere prudential policy which, under the circumstance, imperiously forbade the slightest symptom of open disaffection, however transient, in the important chief officer of his ship. However it was, his orders were executed, and the Burtons were hoisted. Chapter 110 Queequeg in His Coffin Upon searching, it was found that the casks last struck into the hold were perfectly sound, and that the leak must be further off. So, it being calm weather, they broke out deeper and deeper, disturbing the slumbers of the huge ground-tier butts, and from that black midnight sending those gigantic moles into the daylight above. So deep did they go, and so ancient and corroded and weedy the aspect of the lowermost puncheons, that you almost looked next for some mouldy cornerstone cask containing coins of Captain Noah, with copies of the posted placards vainly warning the infatuated old world from the flood. Tierce after tierce, too, of water and bread and beef and shooks of staves and iron bundles of hoops were hoisted out, till at last the piled decks were hard to get about, and the hollow hull echoed underfoot, as if you were treading over empty catacombs, and reeled and rolled in the sea like an air-freighted demijohn. Top-heavy was the ship as a dinnerless student with all Aristotle in his head. Well was it that the typhoons did not visit them then. Now at this time it was that my poor pagan companion and fast-bosom friend Queequeg was seized with a fever, which brought him nigh to his endless end. 
Be it said that in this vocation of whaling, sinecures are unknown. Dignity and danger go hand in hand. Till you get to be captain, the higher you rise, the harder you toil. So with poor Queequeg, who, as harpooner, must not only face all the rage of the living whale, but, as we have elsewhere seen, mount his dead back in a rolling sea, and finally descend into the gloom of the hold, and, bitterly sweating all day in that subterraneous confinement, resolutely manhandle the clumsiest casks, and see to their stowage. To be short, among whalemen, the harpooners are the holders, so called. Poor Queequeg! When the ship was about half disemboweled, you should have stooped over the hatchway and peered down upon him there, where, stripped to his woollen drawers, the tattooed savage was crawling about amid that dampness and slime, like a green-spotted lizard at the bottom of a well. And a well or an ice-house it somehow proved to him, poor pagan, where, strange to say, for all the heat of his sweatings, he caught a terrible chill which lapsed into a fever, and at last, after some days' suffering, laid him in his hammock, close to the very sill of the door of death. How he wasted and wasted away in those few long, lingering days, till there seemed but little left of him but his frame and tattooing. But as all else in him thinned, and his cheekbones grew sharper, his eyes nevertheless seemed growing fuller and fuller. They became of a strange softness of luster, and mildly but deeply looked out at you there from his sickness, a wondrous testimony to that immortal health in him which could not die or be weakened. And, like circles on the water which, as they grow fainter, expand, so his eyes seemed rounding and rounding like the rings of eternity. An awe that cannot be named would steal over you, as you sat by the side of this waning savage, and saw as strange things in his face as any beheld who were bystanders when Zoroaster died. For whatever is truly wondrous and fearful in man, never yet was put into words or books. And the drawing near of death, which alike levels all, alike impresses all, with a last revelation, which only an author from the dead could adequately tell. So that, let us say it again, no dying Chaldee or Greek had higher and holier thoughts than those whose mysterious shades you saw creeping over the face of poor Queequeg, as he quietly lay in his swaying hammock, and the rolling sea seemed gently rocking him to his final rest, and the ocean's invisible flood-tide lifted him higher and higher towards his destined heaven. Not a man of the crew but gave him up, and as for Queequeg himself, what he thought of the case was forcibly shown by a curious favour he asked. He called one to him in the grey morning watch when the day was just breaking, and taking his hand said that while in Nantucket he had chanced to see certain little canoes of dark wood, like the rich war-wood of his native isle, and, upon inquiry, he had learned that all whalemen who died in Nantucket were laid in those same dark canoes, and that the fancy of being so laid had much pleased him, for it was not unlike the custom of his own race who, after embalming a dead warrior, stretched him out in his canoe, and so left him to be floated away to the starry archipelagos. For not only do they believe that the stars are isles, but that far beyond all visible horizons, their own mild, uncontinented seas interflow with the blue heavens, and so form the white breakers of the Milky Way. He added that he shuddered at the thought of being buried in his hammock, according to the usual sea custom, tossed like something vile to the death-devouring sharks. No, he desired a canoe, like those of Nantucket, all the more congenial to him, being a whaleman, that like a whale-boat these coffin canoes were without a keel, though that involved but uncertain steering and much leeway adown the dim ages. Now when this strange circumstance was made known aft, the carpenter was at once commanded to do Queequeg's bidding, whatever it might include. There was some heathenish, coffin-coloured old lumber aboard, which, upon a long previous voyage, had been cut from the aboriginal groves of the Lackaday Islands, and from these dark planks the coffin was recommended to be made. 
No sooner was the carpenter apprised of the order, than taking his rule he forthwith, with all the indifferent promptitude of his character, proceeded into the forecastle and took Queequeg's measure with great accuracy, regularly chalking Queequeg's person as he shifted the rule. "'Ah, poor fellow! He'll have to die now!' ejaculated the Long Island sailor. Going to his vice-bench, the carpenter, for convenience sake and general reference, now transferringly measured on it the exact length the coffin was to be, and then made the transfer permanent by cutting two notches at its extremities. This done, he marshalled the planks in his tools, and to work. When the last nail was driven, and the lid duly planed and fitted, he lightly shouldered the coffin and went forward with it inquiring whether they were ready for it yet in that direction. Overhearing the indignant but half-humorous cries with which the people on deck began to drive the coffin away, Queequeg, to everyone's consternation, commanded that the thing should be instantly brought to him, nor was there any denying him, seeing that of all mortals some dying men are the most tyrannical, and certainly since they will shortly trouble us so little for evermore the poor fellows ought to be indulged. Leaning over in his hammock, Queequeg long regarded the coffin with an attentive eye. He then called for his harpoon, and had the wooden stock drawn from it, and then had the iron part placed in the coffin along with one of the paddles of his boat. All by his own request, also, biscuits were then ranged round the sides within, a flask of fresh water was placed at the head, and a small bag of woody earth scraped up in the hold at the foot and a piece of sailcloth being rolled up for a pillow, Queequeg now entreated to be lifted into his final bed, that he might make trial of its comforts, if any it had. He lay without moving a few minutes, then told one to go to his bag and bring out his little god, Yojo. Then, crossing his arms on his breast with Yojo between, he called for the coffin lid, hatch, he called it, to be placed over him. The head part turned over with a leather hinge, and there lay Queequeg in his coffin, with little but his composed countenance in view. Rarmai! It will do, it is easy, he murmured at last, and signed to be replaced in his hammock. But ere this was done, Pip, who had been slyly hovering nearby all this while, drew nigh to him where he lay, and with soft sobbings took him by the hand in the other holding his tambourine. "'Poor rover! Will ye never have done with all this weary roving? Where go ye now? But if the currents carry ye to those sweet Antilles, where the beaches are only beat with water-lilies, will ye do one little errand for me? Seek out one Pip, who's now been missing long. I think he's in those far Antilles. If ye find him, then comfort him, for he must be very sad. For look, He's left his tambourine behind. I found it. Rig-a-dig-dig. -dig. Now, Queequeg, die, and I'll beat your dying march. I have heard, murmured Starbuck, gazing down the scuttle, that in violent fevers men, all ignorance, have talked in ancient tongues, and that when the mystery is probed it turns out always that in their wholly forgotten childhood those ancient tongues had been really spoken in their hearing by some lofty scholars. So to my fond faith poor Pip, in this strange sweetness of his lunacy, brings heavenly vouchers of all our heavenly homes. Where learned he that but there? Hark, he speaks again, but more wildly now. Form two and two! Let's make a general of him. Ho! Oh, where's his harpoon? Lay it across here. Rig-a-dig-dig! -dig. Huzzah! Oh, for a gamecock now to sit upon his head and crow! Queequeg dies game! Mind ye that! Queequeg dies game! Take ye good heed of that! Queequeg dies game, I say! Game, game, game! But base little Pip, he died a coward! Died all a-shiver! Out upon Pip! Hark ye! If you find Pip, tell all the Antilles he's a runaway, a coward, a coward, a coward. Tell them he jumped from a whaleboat. I'd never beat my tambourine over base Pip, and hail him general, if he were once more dying here. No, no, shame upon all cowards, shame upon them. Let him go drown like Pip that jumped from a whaleboat. 
Shame! Shame! During all this, Queequeg lay with closed eyes, as if in a dream. Pip was led away, and the sick man was replaced in his hammock. But now that he had apparently made every preparation for death, now that his coffin was proved a good fit, Queequeg suddenly rallied. Soon there seemed no need of the carpenter's box, and thereupon, when some expressed their delighted surprise, he, in substance, said that the cause of his sudden convalescence was this. At a critical moment he had just recalled a little duty ashore, which he was leaving undone, and therefore had changed his mind about dying. He could not die yet, he averred. They asked him, then, whether to live or die was a matter of his own sovereign will and pleasure. He answered, certainly. In a word, it was Queequeg's conceit that if a man made up his mind to live, mere sickness could not kill him. Nothing but a whale, or a gale, or some violent, ungovernable, unintelligent destroyer of that sort. Now, there is this noteworthy difference between savage and civilized, that while a sick civilized man may be six months convalescing, generally speaking, a sick savage is almost half well again in a day. So, in good time, my Queequeg gains strength, and at length, after sitting on the windlass for a few indolent days, but eating with a vigorous appetite, he suddenly leaped to his feet, threw out his arms and legs, gave himself a good stretching, yawned a little bit, and then, springing into the head of his hoisted boat, and poising a harpoon, pronounced himself fit for a fight. With a wild whimsiness he now used his coffin for a sea-chest, and emptying into it his canvas bag of clothes, set them in order there. Many spare hours he spent in carving the lid with all manner of grotesque figures and drawings, and it seemed that hereby he was striving, in his rude way, to copy parts of the twisted tattooing on his body. And this tattooing had been the work of a departed prophet and seer on his island, who, by those hieroglyphic marks, had written out on his body a complete theory of the heavens and the earth, and a mystical treatise on the art of attaining truth, so that Queequeg in his own proper person was a riddle to unfold, a wondrous work in one volume, but whose mysteries not even himself could read, though his own live heart beat against them. And these mysteries were therefore destined in the end to moulder away with the living parchment whereon they were inscribed, and so be unsolved to the last. And this thought it must have been which suggested to Ahab that wild exclamation of his, when one morning turning away from surveying poor Queequeg, Oh, devilish tantalization of the gods! Chapter 111 the Pacific. When gliding by the Bashi Isles, we emerged at last upon the great South Sea. Were it not for other things, I could have greeted my dear Pacific with uncounted thanks, for now the long supplication of my youth was answered. That serene ocean rolled eastwards from me a thousand leagues of blue. There is one knows not what sweet mystery about this sea whose gentle, awful stirring seemed to speak of some hidden soul beneath, like those fabled undulations of the Ephesian sod over the buried evangelist St. John. And meet it is that over these sea pastures, wide rolling watery prairies and potter's fields of all four continents, the waves should rise and fall, and ebb and flow unceasingly. For here millions of mixed shades and shadows, drowned dreams, somnambulisms, reveries, all that we call lives and souls, lie dreaming, dreaming still, tossing like slumberers in their beds, the ever-rolling waves but made so by their restlessness. To any meditative Magian rover this serene Pacific, once beheld, must ever after be the sea of his adoption. It rolls the midmost waters of the world, the Indian Ocean and Atlantic being but its arms. The same waves wash the moles of the new-built Californian towns, but yesterday planted by the recentest race of men, and lave the faded but still gorgeous skirts of Asiatic lands older than Abraham, 
while all between float milky ways of coral isles and low-lying, endless, unknown archipelagos and impenetrable Japans. Thus this mysterious, divine Pacific zones the world's whole bulk about, makes all coasts one bay to it, seems the tide-beating heart of earth. Lifted by those eternal swells, you needs must own the seductive god, bowing your head to Pan. But few thoughts of Pan stirred Ahab's brain, as, standing like an iron statue at his accustomed place beside the mizzen-rigging, with one nostril he unthinkingly snuffed the sugary musk from the bashy isles, in whose sweet woods mild lovers must be walking, and with the other consciously inhaled the salt breath of the new-found sea, that sea in which the hated white whale must even then be swimming, launched at length upon these almost final waters, and gliding towards the Japanese cruising-ground, the old man's purpose intensified itself. His firm lips met like the lips of a vice. The delta of his forehead's veins swelled like overladen brooks, in his very sleep, his ringing cry ran through the vaulted hull. Stern all! The white whale spouts thick blood! Chapter 112 The Blacksmith Availing himself of the mild, summer-cool weather that now reigned in these latitudes, and in preparation for the peculiarly active pursuit shortly to be anticipated, Perth, the begrimed, blistered old blacksmith, had not removed his portable forge to the hold again, after concluding his contributory work for Ahab's leg, but still retained it on deck, fast lashed to ring-bolts by the foremast, being now almost incessantly invoked by the headsmen and harpooners and bowsmen to do some little job for them, altering or repairing or new-shaping their various weapons and boat furniture. Often he would be surrounded by an eager circle, all waiting to be served, holding boat spades, pike heads, harpoons, and lances, and jealously watching his every sooty movement as he toiled. Nevertheless, this old man's was a patient hammer wielded by a patient arm. No murmur, no impatience, no petulance did come from him. Silent, slow, and solemn, bowing over still further his chronically broken back, he toiled away, as if toil were life itself, and the heavy beating of his hammer the heavy beating of his heart. And so it was. Most miserable. A peculiar walk in this old man, a certain slight but painful appearing yawing in his gait, had at an early period of the voyage excited the curiosity of the mariners, and to the importunity of their persisted questionings he had finally given in. So it came to pass that every one now knew the shameful story of his wretched fate. Belated, and not innocently, one bitter winter's midnight, on the road running between two country towns, the blacksmith half-stupidly felt the deadly numbness stealing over him, and sought refuge in a leaning, dilapidated barn. The issue was the loss of the extremities of both feet. Out of this revelation, part by part, at last came out the four acts of the gladness, and the one long and as yet uncatastrophied fifth act of the grief of his life's drama. He was an old man who, at the age of nearly sixty, had postponedly encountered that thing in sorrow's technicals called ruin. He had been an artisan of famed excellence, and with plenty to do, owned a house and garden, embraced a youthful, daughter-like, loving wife, and three blithe, ruddy children, every Sunday went to a cheerful-looking church planted in a grove. But one night, under cover of darkness, and further concealed in a most cunning disguisement, a desperate burglar slid into his happy home, and robbed them all of everything. And darker yet to tell, the blacksmith himself did ignorantly conduct this burglar into his family's heart. It was the bottle conjurer. Upon the opening of that fatal cork, forth flew the fiend and shriveled up his home. Now, for prudent, most wise, and economic reasons, the blacksmith's shop was in the basement of his dwelling, but with a separate entrance to it, so that always had the young and loving healthy wife listened with no unhappy nervousness, but with vigorous pleasure, 
to the stout ringing of her young-armed old husband's hammer, whose reverberations, muffled by passing through the floors and walls, came up to her not unsweetly in her nursery. And so to stout labor's iron lullaby the blacksmith's infants were rocked to slumber. Oh, woe on woe! O oh, death, why canst thou not sometimes be timely? Hadst thou taken this old blacksmith to thyself ere his full ruin came upon him, then had the young widow had a delicious grief, and her orphans a truly venerable, legendary sire to dream of in their after years, and all of them a care-killing competency. But death plucked down some virtuous elder brother, on whose whistling daily toil solely hung the responsibilities of some other family, and left the worse than useless old man standing, till the hideous rot of life should make him easier to harvest. Why tell the whole? The blows of the basement hammer every day grew more and more between, and each blow every day grew fainter than the last. The wife sat frozen at the window, with tearless eyes, glitteringly gazing into the weeping faces of her children. The bellows fell, the forge choked up with cinders, the house was sold, the mother dived down into the long churchyard grass, her children twice followed her thither, and the houseless, familyless old man staggered off a vagabond in crape, his every woe unreverenced, his grey head a scorn to flaxen curls. Death seems the only desirable sequel for a career like this, but death is only a launching into the region of the strange untried. It is but the first salutation to the possibilities of the immense remote, the wild, the watery, the unshored. Therefore, to the death-longing eyes of such men, who still have left in them some interior compunctions against suicide, does the all-contributed and all-receptive ocean alluringly spread forth his whole plane of unimaginable, taking terrors, and wonderful, new-life adventures, and from the hearts of infinite pacifics, the thousand mermaids sing to them, Come hither, broken-hearted, here is another life without the guilt of intermediate death. Here are wonders supernatural, without dying for them. Come hither, bury thyself in a life which, to your now equally abhorred and abhorring landed world, is more oblivious than death. Come hither, put up thy gravestone too within the churchyard, and come hither till we marry thee. Hearkening to these voices, east and west, by early sunrise, and by fall of eve, the blacksmith's soul responded, I, I come. And so Perth went a wailing. Chapter 113 The Forge with matted beard, and swathed in a bristling shark-skin apron, about midday, Perth was standing between his forge and anvil, the latter placed upon an ironwood log, with one hand holding a pike-head in the coals, and with the other at his forge's lungs, when Captain Ahab came along, carrying in his hand a small, rusty-looking leathern bag. While yet a little distance from the forge, Moody Ahab paused, till at last Perth, withdrawing his iron from the fire, began hammering it upon the anvil, the red mass sending off the sparks in thick, hovering flights, some of which flew close to Ahab. "'Are these thy mother Carrie's chickens, Perth? They are always flying in thy wake. Birds of good omen, too, but not to all. Look here, they burn. But thou, thou livest among them without a scorch.' "'Because I am scorched all over, Captain Ahab,' answered Perth, resting for a moment on his hammer. "'I am past scorching. Not easily canst thou scorch a scar.' "'Well, well, no more. Thy shrunk voice sounds too calmly, sanely woeful to me. In no paradise myself, I am impatient of all misery in others that is not mad.' Thou shouldst go mad, blacksmith. Say, why dost thou not go mad? How canst thou endure without being mad? Do the heavens yet hate thee, that thou canst not go mad? 
What wert thou making there? Welding an old pikehead, sir. There were seams and dents in it. And canst thou make it all smooth again, blacksmith, after such hard usage as it had? I think so, sir. And I suppose thou canst smooth almost any seams and dents, never mind how hard the metal, blacksmith? Ay, sir, I think I can. All seams and dents but one. Look ye here, then, cried Ahab, passionately advancing, and leaning with both hands on Perth's shoulders. Look ye here, here. Can you smooth out a seam like this, blacksmith? sweeping one hand across his ribbed brow. If thou couldst, blacksmith, glad enough would I lay my head upon thy anvil, and feel thy heaviest hammer between my eyes. Answer! Canst thou smooth this seam? Oh, that is the one, sir. Said I not, all seams and dents but one? Aye, blacksmith, it is the one. Aye, man, it is unsmoothable. For though thou only seest it here in my flesh, it is worked down into the bone of my skull. That is all wrinkles. But away with child's play. No more gaffs and pikes to-day. Look ye here, jingling the leathern bag, as if it were full of gold coins. I, too, want a harpoon made, one that a thousand yoke of fiends could not part perth. Something that will stick in a whale like his own fin bone. There's the stuff, flinging the pouch upon the anvil. Look ye, blacksmith, these are the gathered nail stubs of the steel shoes of racing horses. Horseshoe stubs, sir. Why, Captain Ahab, thou hast there then the best and stubbornest stuff we blacksmiths ever work. I know it, old man. These stubs will weld together like glue from the melted bones of murderers. Quick, forge me the harpoon, and forge me first twelve rods for its shank. Then wind and twist and hammer these twelve together like the yarns and strands of a tow-line. Quick, I'll blow the fire. When at last the twelve rods were made, Ahab tried them one by one by spiraling them with his own hand round a long, heavy iron bolt. A flaw, rejecting the last one. Work that over again, Perth. This done, Perth was about to begin welding the twelve into one, when Ahab stayed his hand and said he would weld his own iron. As then, with regular gasping hems, he hammered on the anvil, Perth passing to him the glowing rods, one after the other, and the hard-pressed forge shooting up its intense straight flame, the Parsi passed silently, and bowing over his head towards the fire, seemed invoking some curse, or some blessing, on the toil. But as Ahab looked up, he slid aside. "'What's that bunch of Lucifers dodging about there for?' muttered Stubb, looking on from the forecastle. "'That Parsi smells fire like a fusee and smells of it himself, like a hot musket's powder-pan. At last the shank in one complete rod received its final heat, and as Perth, to temper it, plunged it all hissing into the cask of water nearby, the scalding steam shot up into Ahab's bent face. "'Wouldst thou brand me, Perth?' wincing for a moment with the pain. "'Have I been but forging my own branding iron, then?' "'Pray God, not that!' Yet I fear something, Captain Ahab. Is not this harpoon for the white whale? For the white fiend. But now for the barbs. Thou must make them thyself, man. Here are my razors, the best of steel. Here, and make the barbs sharp as the needle sleet of the icy sea. For a moment the old blacksmith eyed the razors, as though he would fain not use them. Take them, man. I have no need for them, for I now neither shave, sup, nor pray till... But here, to work! Fashioned at last into an arrowy shape, and welded by Perth to the shank, the steel soon pointed the end of the iron, and as the blacksmith was about giving the barbs their final heat prior to tempering them, he cried to Ahab to place the water-cask near. No, no! 
No water for that. I want it of the true death temper. Ahoy there! Tashtego! Queequeg! Dagoo! What say ye, pagans? Will you give me as much blood as will cover this barb? Holding it high up. A cluster of dark nods replied, Yes. Three punctures were made in the heathen flesh, and the white whale's barbs were then tempered. Ego non baptizo te in nomine patris sed in nomine diaboli, deliriously howled Ahab, as the malignant iron scorchingly devoured the baptismal blood. Now, mustering the spare poles from below, and selecting one of hickory, with the bark still investing it, Ahab fitted the end to the socket of the iron. A coil of new tow-line was then unwound, and some fathoms of it taken to the windlass, and stretched to a great tension. Pressing his foot upon it, till the rope hummed like a harp-string, then eagerly bending over it, and seeing no strandings, Ahab exclaimed, Good! And now for the seizings! At one extremity the rope was unstranded, and the separate spread yarns were all braided and woven round the socket of the harpoon. The pole was then driven hard up into the socket. From the lower end the rope was traced halfway along the pole's length, and firmly secured so, with intertwistings of twine. This done, pole, iron, and rope, like the three fates, remained inseparable, and Ahab moodily stalked away with the weapon. The sound of his ivory leg, and the sound of the hickory pole, both hollowly ringing along every plank. But ere he entered his cabin, light, unnatural, half-bantering, yet most piteous sound was heard. O oh, Pip! Thy wretched laugh, thy idle but unresting eye, all thy strange mummeries not unmeaningly blended with the black tragedy of the melancholy ship, and mocked it. End of chapters 109 to 113